picture here is a colorized version of a famous illustration that was done depicting the 1755 earthquake that destroyed Lisbon, Portugal. This was an earthquake that struck the city, which was medieval in design and structural integrity. The earthquake itself obviously severely damaged the buildings, and the subsequent tsunami wiped out anything that was near the coastline. People, buildings, livestock, etc., all destroyed. The king of Portugal at the time was kind of a wealthy, lazy, uh, playboy type guy who was spending time in the country palace. After the earthquake, he became paranoid. He was claustrophobic. He lived in a tent most of the rest of his life. It was a really nice tent, but it was still a tent. And his right-hand man redesigned the city of Lisbon. It went from a medieval jumble of nonsense, if you've ever been to a medieval city, you know what I'm talking about, to one with fairly wide streets, straight lines, organization. So this was much better in case of emergency in the future. It was more organized in terms of moving people and food and animals and all the things that need to move around. So it improved Portugal. Portugal went from medieval to 1760s modern. This rebuilding took place only two decades before the Laki eruption, which then changed the climate, disrupting things in Europe, particularly in the West. So all this ties together. Here we see an image of the city of Sparta as it was being destroyed by an earthquake in 464 BCE. According to a number of historians, this earthquake was one of the most destructive ancient earthquakes, destroying Sparta completely. More than 20,000 people were killed. And according to legend, only five houses were left intact. There was an arcade where Spartans were exercising. This is kind of a gymnasium. That gymnasium collapsed in the earthquake, killing all of the people that were in the gymnasium. And it was left as is the tomb being called the Seismatius. We've been talking about devastation, destruction. We've been looking at images of the catastrophes that earthquakes are, but now we need to talk about how this happens. What are the fault mechanisms that we can glean from earthquake data? What kinds of patterns can we observe? And what do we know about the patterns of ground shaking based on P waves? The first appearance of a P wave on a seismograph tells you something about the nature of the ground shaking. It gives us information on the orientation of the fault rupture, and it gives us information on the direction of slip. How does this work? Well, we have a couple of block diagrams here that we'll go through one at a time. These fault mechanisms will tell us whether the rupture was normal, as seen here, reverse, as seen here, or a strike slip rupture, as seen here. So starting out with some basic terminology, the fault line is the surficial expression of the fault. The dip is the incline of the fault plane from the horizontal. So it can only be 90 degrees maximum. In other words, it's always less than 90 degrees. So here, the dip looks like it's about you know, 80, 75, 80 degrees or so. So this dip is a surface that you would observe if the fault was exposed at the ground surface. Here we see a normal fault. This is caused by tension, stretching of the crust. We've seen this in earlier lectures, our lecture on plate tectonics and the interior of the earth, and a little bit from the continental lecture that you saw just prior to the volcano lecture series when we talked about the basin and range tectonics of Nevada. So here we have tensional forces stretching the crust and it causes one block to drop down relative to another. This is a normal fault caused by tension. So as we pull these blocks apart, they slide vertically relative to one another. This is called the hanging wall, because if you were in a mine on a fault, you would hang your lantern from this block. This is the foot wall, because your feet would be on this wall. So foot wall is what you stand on, hanging wall is what you would hang something from. And the movement is going to be like this, tensional. In the case of a reverse fault, we have compressional forces. We're crunching two blocks together. As we crunch them together, one is going to ride up on top of another. When a car comes together with a truck in an accident, the truck rides up over the car usually. It's got a higher position, which is why that happens. But in the case of the block here, something similar, it's going to rise up over the other block. 
So the hanging wall is going to rise relative to the foot wall, opposite of the case of the normal fall. In the case of a strike-slip fall, we have shearing forces. We have one block moving in this direction, the adjacent block moving in this direction. That's offsetting the stream flow here. So the stream would likely run along the fault line and continue. In a normal fault, the block above the fault, called the hanging wall, moves down relative to the block below the fault, called the foot wall. This fault motion is caused by tensional forces and results in extension. In a reverse fault, the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall. This motion is caused by compressional forces and results in overall shortening. A strike-slip fault is a near-vertical fracture where the ground has shifted parallel to Earth's surface due to horizontal shearing forces. If you stand on one side of the fault and the block opposite you shifts left, it is called a left lateral fault. If it moves right, it's a right lateral fault. How do we know which portion of the land is moving in which way from seismology alone? If you're present there, you can watch it and see the offset of a fence and you say, I know exactly what's happening. But you can do this using seismic waves as well. So here we have an example of a fault, a strike-slip fault with four seismographic stations, four seismographs located one in each quadrant. The first motion is going to be a push away from the epicenter. So we're looking at this seismograph. It's pushing away from the epicenter and the, there's an initial rise in the waveform here. So it's pushing away from the epicenter, away from the focus towards this seismograph. There's gonna be an inflection. It's coming towards you so it makes sense that this rises first. In this seismograph, the first motion is towards the epicenter, towards the focus. It's going to pull the seismograph down. Push towards you, it goes up. Pull it away from you, it goes down. It's going to be the same for these other sectors. So now we have the first wave. This is pushing towards you. And we have an amplitude a displacement, in this case in millimeters. So this is going to give us the direction of motion as well as the magnitude of that motion, the amount of movement over a given period of time. Now, earthquakes are related directly to plate tectonics. There are some intraplate earthquakes. They're fairly rare, but they do exist. Most occur at divergent boundaries, at transform fault boundaries, and at convergent boundaries almost all earthquakes occur at these boundaries. However, as I mentioned a second ago, 50 seconds ago, interplate earthquakes are possible as well. Oftentimes they're associated with things like mantle plumes. The earthquakes of Yellowstone are in the middle of the continent, but there's a lot going on below the surface that can irritate the crust into quaking. When we look at world seismicity from 1976 to 2002, you can see very clearly that most of the earthquakes happen to be associated directly with plate boundaries. In fact, we can define plate boundaries to a large degree only from earthquake activity. We don't need to know anything else. We do get additional information, though, on the type of faulting from the type of earthquake that results. Deep focus earthquakes are more than 300 kilometers in depth. That's the the focus is more than 300 kilometers below the surface. The intermediate depth earthquakes are 50 to 300 kilometers below the surface. And shallow focus earthquakes are less than 50 kilometers in depth. Taking a look at a divergent boundary, the Mid-Ocean Ridge in the Atlantic is our prime example. We have a series of normal faults. Again, this is pulling apart. The European plate is moving away from the North American plate if we're looking at the mid-ocean ridge near Iceland. Associated with these normal faults are going to be transform lateral faults. These are adjusting faults for the general spread on the, the ridge here. So shallow earthquakes are going to coincide with the normal faulting, with the blocks dropping down as crust is being created. Large shallow earthquakes are going to occur mainly on thrust faults at the plate boundary. 
So these are going to be major earthquakes that are near the surface related to big sudden slips in a subduction zone, for example. These are relatively minor quakes. They occur very, very often. This is a fairly sizable earthquake. It occurs occasionally. As we move further down the subduction zone, we enter the range of intermediate focus earthquakes. And ultimately, the deepest earthquakes, the deep focus earthquakes, can be the biggest earthquakes. They can be the 9.5s that we see in Chile and Sumatra and Alaska, for example. Here we have the lithosphere sliding beneath lithosphere getting stuck or hung up either near the surface at intermediate depths or deep down in the subduction zone. Taking a look at the most famous fault system in the world, and it's most famous because it's in the U.S. and there are a lot of people living around it, the fault system of Southern California seen here, the San Andreas Fault, the main fault, the big one, located right here this thick white band, and we have lots of subsidiary faults, some that are parallel and some that are perpendicular to the San Andreas Fault. So this is the San Andreas Fault as it appears in LA, Los Angeles, and you'll notice there are some big earthquakes, and there are significantly more smaller earthquakes. In this case, small can still be pretty damaging. Example would be the Northridge earthquake in 1994, magnitude 6.7, not quite small, but very damaging. Long Beach, a bit smaller, 6.4, but still very damaging, devastating to the people of Long Beach. And then a whole variety of other earthquakes that have occurred really in the last hundred years. The critical relationship between earthquakes and humans is the destruction caused by the earthquakes. There's a loss of life, that's the most immediately felt. There's property damage, that's the most immediately seen. And subsequently, there can be tsunamis and landslides. These are gonna be subsequent, but very shortly after the initial shaking. Here we have an example from January 17th, 1994, Los Angeles, California. 57 people were killed, more than 8,700 injured, and $20 billion in damage was done, also on my birthday. In Kobe, Japan, the next year, also on my birthday, 6,434 people were killed, 102 billion in damages were the result of this earthquake. Both of these earthquakes occurred in modern, well-developed cities. And you can see the devastation that's wrought upon the city in these earthquakes. In this case, the whole highway tipped over, an elevated roadway collapsed and dumped all the vehicles onto the side street here. The 2005 earthquake in Kashmir killed between 75 and 86,000 people. Over 106,000 were injured. Now the increase in death and structural damage is in large part due to the difference in structural requirements between Kashmir, Southern California, and Kobe, Japan. Mexico City, 1985, 10,000 to 40,000 people were killed three to four billion in damage. Again, structural integrity is going to be a component of the damage here, the devastation, because there are weak building codes in Mexico City. Also, Mexico City is an old lake basin. It's essentially a big lake at high altitude that's been filled in with sediment and various debris over the last couple hundred years. And now it's like a big bowl of jello. When an earthquake hits Mexico City, the whole basin shakes like a bowl of jello. And putting a building made of bricks on top of jello, which is violently shaking, results in the building coming down. In Thailand, the tsunami that hit in 2004 posed a whole new crisis for modern people. Tsunamis have been around as long as the ocean has been around, but we didn't hear about them much until 2004, until the Boxing Day tsunami of Thailand. During this event, as is typical, people see the ocean retreat. The ocean backs away, exposing ground, exposing coral reefs. People get curious. Hey, I've never seen a coral reef before. Let's walk out and check it out. And while people are out there checking out the rapidly reduced sea level, it comes back. Out in the open ocean, a tsunami might only be 
a couple millimeters or centimeters high, but when it reaches shallower zones around the ocean, that wave builds up rapidly. So something that's only a centimeter high, a couple hundred miles away, might suddenly rise to be 50 or 100 feet high, 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters in height. And that's what happened in Thailand. This earthquake was caused by subduction and triggered a series of devastating tsunamis along the coast of most land masses bordering the Indian Ocean. Over 230,000 people in 14 countries were killed during the inundation of coastal communities with waves that were up to 30 meters high. That's about 100 feet. The initial magnitude was calculated to be 9.1 to 9.3, making it the third largest earthquake ever recorded on a seismograph. The earthquake had the longest duration of faulting ever observed, between 8.3 and 10 minutes. So this very extreme shaking lasted for between eight and 10 minutes. It caused the entire planet Earth to vibrate as much as one centimeter or almost a half an inch and triggered other earthquakes as far away as Alaska. At the end of it all, the worldwide community donated more than $14 billion in humanitarian aid for people that were devastated by this earthquake and tsunami. Thought question for the chapter. Why do the largest earthquakes occur on subduction megathrusts and not, say, on continental strike slip faults? Why are great tsunamis, such as the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, so rare? 